Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey there, I'm Brian Brushwood. And that was Meet the Pyrel, the hotly anticipated, I guess, final chapter of the Meet the Team series from Team Fortress 2. And there's a particular reason I picked it for our opening video, which you'll find out later on. That's a very good tease, Brian Brushwood. Well, I was a bully as a child, which is why I'm good at teasing. Oh, very nice. Um, I was bullied. As a child. Joining <laughs> us, uh, as promised a couple weeks ago, Scott Wilkinson from Home Theater Geeks. And uh, good to have you at our new time on Mondays. Home Theater Geeks is now our lead in at one o'clock. And, I'm so uh, happy to be here and glad to uh, glad to be here after the new time of uh, Home Theater Geeks in my brand new studio. Yeah, the studio looks great, man. I, I'm loving it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we took, took some time to do some set design and some lighting. and It looks totally out blinked good. out. Like, all you need is a wizard hat, and I would think you were from the future. Like, that was, it was awesome. Well, no, notice my Cylon is wearing the uh, the twit uh, fez. By your command. <laughs> oh, he is. Thank goodness. By your command. <laughs> well, everything is, everything is new. We got a new time. We've got a new studio for Scott. And we've got a new The Big Story. This just in, The Big Story. Our first big story is the fight between AMC and Dish Network has finally reached blink time. AMC has been dropped from the Dish Network in favor of HDNet movies. Uh, And also the AMC channels We, Women's Entertainment, and IFC will be replaced with Style and HDNet. Now, AMC was able to resolve their differences with AT&T U-verse, but not with Dish. Dish and AMC... Like this, and Breaking Bad is premiering their new season July 15th. 13 days so to figure this out. Maybe this is, maybe it's apropos that I claim to be a bully and you said you were bullied because this sounds like that same schoolyard fight that we hear all the time. We know nothing's going to change. We know nobody's going to kill or defeat the other person, but it's just like there's a fight. So we all scramble to be like, fight, 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 AMC, AMC. I mean, it's. Uh, I, I, it's but I disagree with you. Usually it's fight, fight. Oh, but they resolved it at the last minute. Dish has now dropped AMC. But like, you see, okay, well, I mean, they, they've dropped AMC. I mean, yes, you can't yes. watch AMC right now on the Dish Network. 
Right now, now, but see, this is why they started it now, because they got two full weeks of chicken to play. We've seen this with sports all the time. They're all like, I'm sorry, we can't we can't carry the Pirates. It's it's Major League Baseball. It's not our fault. And now, now we're just seeing the same thing with AMC. Now, I do think it's awesome that we're seeing this kind of contest with drama, uh, dr dramatic programming instead of sports. That is news, and that's exciting for me. But as far as, as far as, I don't see anything else truly interesting about this as far as like a revolutionary battle between two forces uh amc keeps maintaining that the issue is a court case between the two companies over voom hd the, uh, a channel that used to be on dish dish tells customers that amc is requiring too much money and is devaluing its programming by offering it on itunes you hear that cord custer cord cutter custers cord cutters <laughs> uh, cord, cord uh, uh, scott what spot is yeah, because I actually wanted to ask Scott. I actually thought that that quote had some merit to it. I, If I'm a cable company, I'm pretty pissed that AMC is making their content available in so many other channels so quickly as well. Because uh, the, the whole reason to buy cable right now is to take advantage of that window so you don't have to wait until it comes out on iTunes. Right. And it's probably going to be better quality than you're going to get by streaming. As, as not great quality as cable is, it's probably better than streaming. Uh, so, you know, I'm always about quality. So that's one of the places I'm going to go first. Uh, but you're right. You're right. Uh, certainly the convenience factor of being able to get it right away when you want it online and not having to go to the cable company. It's the same same problem as uh, HBO Go had. I think we talked about that a couple weeks ago uh, where they people want it to be they want to be able to just get HBO Go on uh, online. But HBO HBO doesn't want to sell it. They It has to be with a cable package. So how is it that Dish gets mad at AMC for putting their st shows on iTunes when every other network, except for the rare cases of an HBO or a Showtime, actually, I think Showtime does it, put their shows on iTunes and That's put their shows on Amazon and put their shows on Hulu. And put, I mean, Tom, this is just this is BS. Tom, what makes it different? Yeah, it's, your, it's a very good question. Well, well, I'll put it for you in the simple terms. Let's go back to the schoolyard. The teacher looks at you and says, if AMC and HBO and Showtime were going to jump off a bridge, would you jump off too? That doesn't no, make no, it right. No, 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 no. That like analogy doesn't work for me. AMC is the is, or Dish is the teacher here saying, AMC, you're misbehaving by putting your shows on iTunes. We're going to punish you by dropping this. But they're not punishing anybody else. Why are they, well, why are they singling out AMC? Because of this court case. That's why. Tom, it doesn't make it right. Just because all these other guys are putting it up on, you know, oh, that's the cool thing. That's the end thing to do. Put your shows on iTunes, make them available for people at a reasonable price. So, Shh, wow, sorry. Yeah. So, Dish should so Dish is, should just be picking on on people in the classroom, is what you're saying. <laughs> Look, I, I just enjoy getting you all riled up. I I don't have any dog. <laughs> in this fight. I'll tell you what, though, I am going to make the prediction that there's no way they let AMC stay off the radar come the launch of, of Breaking Bad. Maybe I'm going to guarantee you within 20 if they if they haven't put AMC back on the roster by the by the premiere of Breaking Bad, 48 hours tops until they come to some kind of magical resolution. Well, and here's the thing. If Dish is really mad at AMC for putting shows on iTunes, you don't take the channel off your network and force all your customers to go buy the shows on <laughs> iTunes. That <laughs> like, like we're going to we're going to show you. We're going you're going to smoke this whole box of cigars and then you'll understand <laughs> right. that right. you'll get addicted. <laughs> hey Tom, what what is this about Voom? I haven't heard that word in a long time and it used to be a great channel. Yeah, and I guess there was a, there's a, I don't actually know what the details of the court case are, but there is a dispute between AMC and Dish over Voom HD that is being played out in court. Dish would like AMC to drop it, and so that's I the theory here. But I haven't seen Voom in in months or or even years. Uh, I thought it was dead. Oh, it is. It's it's very long dead. But but I guess uh, uh, Dish was offering AMC HD. Let me let me let me see if I can figure this out. Uh, Litigation between AMC and Dish Network over dropping the Voom HD channel back in 2008, leading yeah. them to go dark soon after. Uh, and I guess AMC was operating the Voom HD channel, so they're suing Dish over that. Dish wants them to let it go. Uh, and I don't blame Dish. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's long dead. It seems like a silly issue to be arguing about. Right, and, and Dish kind of inherited the Voom channels when they bought Voom and kind of folded them into the Dish service back then. Right. So it's not even something, you know, was Dish was just sort of like, hey, the, these channels were all not doing very well. So we yeah, I, 
I, I got rid I of think a bunch it's of them. A little bit interesting that Dish, on one hand, is in the middle of of um, saying that, oh, AMC, you're devaluing. We're not getting a value out of your programming because you make your stuff available. Uh, by providing the customers a service by making your stuff available on iTunes. But the other head of Dish is is totally cool with the auto hop feature. Meanwhile, they're, you know, allegedly, they're the ones screwing over the broadcast media as well. This I, It's amazing to me that they're trying to take the high ground on both sides of this battle. Yeah, this is... I want to know what the personalities behind this dispute are, right? Because this is actually a fairly typical dispute. On the one hand, you've got AMC saying... Hey, you know what? Yeah, we, we think you broke the terms of a contract over Voom HD back in 2008, so we're taking you to court. And on the other hand, you have Dish saying, you know what? We really want you to lower the fees uh, that we pay to carry your channel. We don't want you to raise them. These are, these are all typical things that happen in business all the time. What caused these two companies to get to the, such a point of brinksmanship uh, I, I, I think is very interesting. And you have two companies that aren't the leaders in their space in either case. You know, AMC is an up-and-comer, but they're always well, complaining that they don't have great... enough money to continue this is to what's support. Great about this fight, this is like this. This isn't the bully taking on the the little wimp. These are two nerds fighting it out. Like, why aren't you <laughs> nerd fight? <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, the entire landscape of cable television and the Internet is being fought out in Congress. Uh, last week uh, was the congressional hearings on the Cable Television Act of 1992, and that's our next big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. And I mean, it's a big story because Congress held the hearing. And... The head of Netflix was there, and a guy from Comcast was there, and David Hyman uh, Net was the Netflix general counsel, was there. You had uh, Charlie Ergen from Dish there. You had David Barrett, president of Hearst Television. You have Roku senior vice president Jim Funk. All stars in the cord-cutting uh, world were showing up, and nobody said anything surprising. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but they did say it in public, on yeah. the record, in an arena, in front of Congress people, and th and that is exciting. It's like when's the last time when we started this show? Would you expect this to be the kind of of uh, talk that we would be seeing in at a congressional hearing? No, I, you know what? And that's a really good point. It's not that we were surprised by what anyone said. Netflix said that when you uh, have limited broadband competition and a strong desire to protect legacy video distribution, that means anti-competitive behavior. Of course, Michael Powell, former. F CC chairman, who's now a head of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association, the lobbying arm of the cable industry, said that he did not like that statement very much. He says it's belied by the facts. Uh, it's just flat wrong. There is no anti-competitive behavior. These are the things you would expect, but they were being said to Congress, and Congress needs to hear all sides of this story. In fact, I will give Congress credit this time, unlike with SOPA earlier this year, they invited all sides of the issue. You had G.G. Sohn, the chief executive of public knowledge there, and you had Comcast, and you had the NCTEA. It, it was a well-balanced panel. Now, what was the stated reason for this panel? Why did they bring everybody in? Well, that's the interesting thing. They're looking at the, uh, the Cable Television Act of 1992, uh, which was meant to uh, balance the playing field so that DISH providers, like DirecTV and DISH, could come in and compete more effectively with cable television. That was a way to bring in some competition, and that has worked. Uh, Dish and, and DirecTV have done very well and, and taken a nice, sizable chunk of the market. Now they're saying, well, you know, it's been quite a while since we had that act. We also have the Internet. We have lots of other video providers coming in off the Internet. So let's look at the act and see what might need to be updated there and the thing is, they've waited too long because the act is almost entirely irrelevant. And that's why the conversations were going off in all these weird areas like bandwidth caps, because we're <laughs> well past the idea of creating competition among the three or four video providers. There's an infinite number of video providers. Yeah, I actually well, want to hear from Scott on this. You what? You I, I said I'd love to hear from Scott on this issue. Uh, well, I mean, I agree completely. It's uh, the, the act is what, 10 years old now, and, and in, in uh, technology terms, you know, that's 20. ancient. It's 20, 20 years old. Yeah. <laughs> that's 20 years old in cable years. Uh, but, uh, but you're right, exactly. The, the world has passed them by, and Congress, of course, it, acting as quickly and uh, expeditiously as they always do, you know, is playing catch-up. So not that it, it – I, well, I don't know what, what, what good it's going to do, except, as you say, Tom – 
you know, people are, are saying these things out loud in public on the record. I don't know if they're under oath or not, but... Uh it's, it's a hearing for a subcommittee. Uh, it's the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology. Whether they actually craft any legislation out of this and send it to the floor remains to be seen. Uh, ran about two hours, so not very long by congressional standards, frankly. Yeah, really. Uh, but you did get a wide variety of, of opinions expressed here. So, Well, I, I think right. that's great. I yeah. really do think that's great. If we're, if we're going to open up an office pool on when we see significant reform of these kinds of issues, because it's great that they're having this dialogue. It's a bummer that it occurs too late. We all want to see change. We all want to see the playing field leveled for everyone so that we can have more competition and give, bring us more choices. How long, and, it's, and I know this is, this is totally bogus because there's no way to say there's one event that's going to snap and then all of a sudden everything's caught up. But are we talking a year till we see substantial legal changes? Two years, three years, five years? What If you were going to play in an office pool, where would you be at on that, Tom? March 2015. <laughs> Seriously. After the next midterm elections, after this presidential cycle. So we oh, see that, two that, years that. Of, of positioning with people feeling out the different lobbyist organizations and the different uh, consumer organizations to craft their position papers. Then they don't do anything because they need to get reelected. And then that following spring, <clears throat> they hit. You know what? That will be the day that... Frame rates, one of the most popular shows on the internet. <laughs> there you go. I, I tend to agree it's going to be several years. Um, and, and I also wanted to mention that, you know, as much as this, the 19, what was it, 1992 Cable Act? Yeah. Uh, you know, tried to uh, f foster uh, competition and so on. I mean, how much competition do we see? There are two satellite networks. That's it. Yeah. And there's only, you know, depending on where you live, you can only get one cable company and maybe Fios if you're lucky or AT&T Uverse. Um, you know, there, I don't see much competition in this, in this field at all. Only in online where you can choose to where you go get one content. You know, you can go to Hulu or you can go to Vudu or you can go to the network itself. Uh, you do have some competition there, and it's totally unregulated. You might see uh, some regulation coming out of the FCC before you see Congress act on this. Exactly. Uh, the FCC exactly. may say, you know what? Must carry rules from the 1992 Act now apply to the Internet. Uh, we've talked no, about it, that before. So that, it, that possibly could happen faster. It, it's interesting because there is sort of a void right now on any kind of action being taken in this space. And it would be interesting to see if, if a bureaucracy like the FCC wants to jump on it or if uh, Congress wants to make hay on the issue and jumping in as well. So I, I hadn't really thought about that angle. That'll be interesting to watch. And, and frankly, the bandwidth cap issue will reach a peak before they get around to re redoing the, the Cable Act. Seriously. And it's already and I, a It'll almost be moot by then because if we resolve the bandwidth cap, then everybody's going to be watching video over the internet. That's just it, that is an unstoppable wave that is coming. Yep. Yep. But I agree. Move on to another big story. Yet, yeah. comma yet. Yeah. Tucking your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Uh, Valve has released something, released something called the Valve Source Filmmaker, which allows you to make better machinima out of valve video games actually any video game that uses the source platform uh yeah. so uh, you were really excited about this brian yeah and actually this was uh, if uh, eagle-eared listeners which is ironic because i don't think eagles have very good ears uh from last <laughs> week remember i said that i had a couple of stories but i only mentioned one of them uh the other one that i spaced on was and luckily there's this follow-up was the fact that valve is going to be making a feature-length movie at using the source engine, which which sounds crazy, considering that this is an engine that's what half a decade old, maybe longer. I think uh, Source came out in two thousand three, I think. But uh, but uh, shoot, almost a decade old. But they they're making a underwater cowboy space western. Uh, called Deep. I said space in there. I just threw that in there for no reason. But basically, <laughs> they're going to create the entire movie in the Source engine, which will allow them unprecedented efficiency, which means that uh, movie sets will suddenly become playable levels for the video game spinoff of this thing. The, the animations used in the movies will show up in the video game. And likewise, this is apparently secretly what they've been doing the entire time 
with this uh, with this meet the team series that they and of course we just saw the final one meet the pyro but this is the same engine that they've used for creating the the intros to the left for dead shorts which are phenomenal i must have rewatched the intros cinematic to left for dead a hundred times because it was so well, no I, I, brian i know you're talking about all the stuff that valve's doing but i think you're burying the lead which is they posted the public to beta called source filmmaker so anybody can do this with any Source Engine game. Left 4 Dead 2, Portal 2, TF2, anything that's on the Source Engine. That, so it's not just that Valve's doing this, which is frankly awesome. Uh, right. Absolutely. That, that was, but that anybody was what I can. Meant to, that was me what I meant to tell you last week. This week, the news is now you can do it as well. And in fact, along with the, the beta for this, they are releasing the entire uh, cinematic engine behind the very first short, the Meet the Heavy, so that you could tweak it yourself. You could start with their work, understand why they did the animations the way they did. You could recut it. And of course, you're seeing right now the, the video from the Meet the Heavy. Uh, th this is phenomenal. And this is so Valve. It's so GD Valve that they would put this together and then give it away for free. There is by the numbers, no reason that they should give this to the world, but they do because they understand in the long term, people love to create as much as they love to, to watch good media. And this is a way for them to build their brand and for get, to get everybody excited about what's possible in this in this new frontier. It's, it's incredibly exciting. So Deep is being oh. uh, directed by Shane Acker uh, in conjunction with okay. Valve. He's the guy who did Nine. Uh, Correct. And then you can then take the Source Engine uh, as Source Filmmaker, run your gameplay through it, edit and dissect it, write down to custom facial expressions. So expect to see a bunch more machinima available for you to watch. Scott, I mean, this this kind of ties right into the home theater geek ends of things, too, I think, it's, doesn't it? It's pretty amazing and better even more so that, that it allows uh, home theater geeks like me, uh, who mostly just consume... To actually create, and I, I'm always in favor of that. I, I think that uh, stimulating creative juices is great. I was about to say this looks just like open source movie making. It really is, and you, you know, know, people love to make machinima where they just do screen caps of the game they're playing, and then they try to cut it to fit. And you, you got to do a lot of, a lot of the compromising in your storytelling to, to get it to all work. And what this mm. does is say, don't compromise your storytelling. Run your gameplay footage through here and make it do what you want it to do in, in yeah. a fairly intuitive way. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't say I'm a big game player because I'm not. But if, <laughs> if that technology that is used to make these games can be then given to people and say, here, go make, you know, it can also be used to make movies. And not only that, but can be, used by anybody to make their own movie uh why youtube will just uh, just got uh, 10 million new channels i mean think about this this is the kind of thing that um this was sort of a story back with the launch of a uh, sky captain in the world of tomorrow mm. the story with that movie was that it was all one guy and of course it was incredibly process intensive he was using high-end materials and and software this is a case where we can reduce the complexity we can reduce the polygon count we can increase the speed of rendering to where somewhere out there is a 17 year old with an amazing story to tell and we are reducing the friction that that keeps him from getting his story out to the world and it's tools like this that make that make new media so much more exciting than old media it's where you can take risks and it's because of decisions like what valve is doing and i, I absolutely stand and applaud them for this Oh, I do too. It's fantastic. What we're see what we're seeing in frame rate over the years is more and more of these kinds of tools allowing more and more people to make more entertainment. Out of that entertainment rises to the top a few really serious quality efforts, uh, and then you start to see more people watching directly from the creators and less and less relying on the mediators. And 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 so we're seeing a collision of that of what we were talking about earlier. With the studios saying, let's put the brakes on things, let's hold up, let's, let's be careful of the regulation, and eventually they're just going to get lapped. They're just going to get passed by the people who are like, you know what, we figured out how to make this stuff on our own. See ya. We don't need you anymore. You can't stop the signal, Tom. I That's think it's right. <laughs> That's why you said Space yeah. Western earlier. That's right. That's right. Fire, Firefly on the brain. Let's uh, <laughs> check into the slipstream, or jump into the slipstream, or maybe slip into the slipstream. Slipstream is streaming services. This is all the news about the services that bring you the shows you want to watch. Uh, and Gigaom had an interesting story up on New TV today about users pushing YouTube 
to let them record videos. You know, YouTube has been cracking down on this. We've talked about it before. A new online petition is urging Google to allow third-party tools and services to record content from YouTube because they say, look, this is what we're used to. We want to DVR stuff. Uh, it's a weird with YouTube where YouTube is a DVR, essentially. I mean, you can watch a YouTube exactly. video anytime you want. It's, it's a streaming DVR, but again, people, it's easy when you, uh, we all run the risk here on this show of living in the bubble where we all uh, tend to be connected to the internet all the time and we all tend to feel like anything streaming is available 24-7, but there's a significant number of people for whom uh, bandwidth is a real issue. And, and there are times that I'm reminded when I'm on the road dealing with hotel Wi-Fi that, wow, offline recording and offline storage is really, really important for entire swaths of Americans and international viewers as well. So if, if, if the, and I'm assuming if I'm understanding this correctly, that the issue is people want to locally store YouTube programs Programming? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, it, it, the, the signers of the petition actually are saying, look, it's just like a cassette, VCR, DVR. We want to be able to record the stuff that we are watching. So we want to be able to play a YouTube video and record an MP3 play uh, of it. We don't necessarily want to do it for piracy reasons. We want to do it for all kinds of reasons, for remixing, for home use, for transferring to our devices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Definitely there are people who can't watch the sword and laser videos uh, but would like to listen to the Sword and Laser YouTube who would like to do this. Not because they're trying to pirate, but because they just want to enjoy it in the way they want to. YouTube so responded to GigaOM saying, we have always taken violations of our terms of service seriously and will continue to afford enforce these terms of services against sites that violate them. And that's what they need to say in public, and it kills me that that's the legal structure that we're under right now. But let me hit you up with something. Have either you or Scott, Tom, Tom Scott, have either of you guys read Neil Stevenson's latest, uh, RIMD? Yes. There's this oh. great section in RIMD where he talks about how the cuisine of the East Coast varies from the, the cuisine of, of Middle America. The difference being that most of Middle America was developed after the Industrial Revolution when you could get all different types of foods in cans already pre-prepared. So on the East Coast and in Europe, you have all these recipes that are about, you know, you harvest your grain, you pound it, you make some bread, you make it all from scratch, you make your own linguine or whatever. Whereas meanwhile in Minnesota, they say buy a can of Hormel chili and mix it with this tuna and blah 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 uh and essentially from from a cream a of mushroom soup culture. usually brian <laughs> <laughs> essentially uh, you have in the american midwest a remix culture versus a uh, uh, an original music culture in in old europe and the point is is imagine if if the look at the current legal structure of of remixes and what's possible right now, you have this entire culture of kids who grow up on YouTube who they don't have a MIDI port on their computer. They don't have a Moog. They don't have piano lessons, but there's music inside them. What they do have is the ability to rip existing media off of YouTube and use uh, pitch modulation to create their own music. And that's where you get some of the most amazing, innovative music that we have of our day. And all of it, by the letter of the law, illegal. Imagine if that was the case when your aunt was putting together her tuna casserole and says, you know, buy this tuna, buy this, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, pasta, throw it together, throw this brand of mayonnaise in there or whatever. Imagine if they were told, no, 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 no. You are actually not buying the mayonnaise. You're buying a license to use this mayonnaise on sandwiches as we approve of. You can't mix this all together and sell it as your own product. Uh, it drives me nuts that this is the unintended consequences of where we are now. And it kills me that it's stifling innovation from such young talent who just doesn't have the resources to do original creation on their own. I agree with Neji in the chat room. He says, I don't think the comparison makes sense, but I know what you mean. Uh, I mean, mayonnaise yeah. is not infinitely replicable the way MP3s are. <laughs> <laughs> but And mayonnaise was designed to be sold and used in recipes, whereas YouTube videos aren't necessarily. It's copyrighted material. Yeah, and once you, you use the mayonnaise, mayonnaise, you don't want anybody else using it. Yeah, right. <laughs> but like, uh, uh, I mean, take something that that clearly is meant for for an end use. You know, like the canned asparagus. Wow. Well, okay, forget it. The 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 point is, <laughs> the point is, we got to change the laws. Well, the recipes, so that, actually, the recipes, the yeah. better re re recipes are the are the better uh, analog here. What if they said you can't uh, use a recipe that calls for cream of mushroom soup to create a dish? Because we have the rights for those recipes. And unless you license that recipe, 
you can't create anything from that risk because that that is something that's infinitely replicable and is not consumed upon use. Yes. So there. But then again, the recipes are there to sell cream of cream of uh, mushroom soup. You know, you're not selling the YouTube videos. They're, you're getting them for free. I would argue, though, and, and studies have shown that if you allow people to make use of the content, they actually like it more and go seek out more by that artist and actually end up spending more money on that artist. So I'll, tell, I'll tell you what, that's that's certainly the case for me when I was. And this is what's amazing to me is how many kids like something, not realizing that what it's a parody of or what it sampled beforehand. And I was the same way when I was in eighth grade. I bought my first CD, which was uh, I'm, I'm going to open up my heart here to you guys, was was Digital Underground. The guys who did the Humpty Dance. Oh, nice. Good uh, one. They actually had <laughs> a bunch of awesome uh, uh, funk uh, remixes. All of the samples came from Parliament and Funkadelic, two bands I'd never heard of until five years later when I decided to hear like, oh, wait, they didn't make any of this. This is all samples from other stuff. And I fell in love with 1970s punk or uh, funk. I said punk. I meant funk. Uh, <laughs> it's George funk, Clinton, yes. P-Funk All-Stars. Uh, it, it became, funk. even though these guys were ripping off the samples from this music, it. I fell in love with it because of the remixes. And there's no reason people can't, that we shouldn't have a legal structure that allows other people to to, to give a similar experience by video. I agree. But the music industry and now the movie industry are so paranoid about getting ripped off and losing anything that they're sort of cutting their nose off to spite their face if if what Tom says is true that uh, and I think and what uh, Brian what you're saying as well that really by allowing people to use this stuff it leads them to spend more ultimately yeah I, I definitely agree with that uh, and and so I I think you know YouTube is is under this this dual pressure. One from the users and one from the industry. And the industry has really got YouTube in a vice grip. Uh, there's the Viacom lawsuit that still has yet to be resolved. Uh, there's the Vivo deal, which funds most of YouTube right now. And YouTube is running scared. They don't want to lose any of this support and they don't want to face more legal problems. And so they are leaning towards what the corporations and the industry wants at the expense of the users. And so they're not willing uh, to, to stand up for users and users' rights, in this case, they're overcorrecting. How and much the corporations are so old school? Jerry Harrison, Casual Gods was my first CD, but <laughs> uh, real quick before we wrap this up, Tom, how much do you think of uh, YouTube's conundrum comes to the fact that they're tied to Google money? When it's like back when YouTube had nothing to fear because they were a nothing company, uh, you know, they obviously, by their own admission, as far as I could tell, uh, let kind of piracy run rampant because they had nothing to lose. But now that they have so much to lose and they're, mis they're, they're in the middle of positioning themselves as the NBC of a new generation – does that force them to be overly cautious or do you think they're no, I think it should I think it should be the opposite because they've got money to fight back with they shouldn't be as scared when they were little and and a lawsuit could wipe them out that's when I would expect them to just kind of roll over and play dead uh, but I, I think what's happened is they they know that they can't continue to leech off of Google Google has said no YouTube you've got you got to make some money uh, and so they're they're trying to balance out that way and the, I, for some reason they they act differently than google google goes to the map for sopa google does all kinds of things to say let's let's help the users let's open source standards let's let's make things work better for the users youtube seems to actually go against that grain slightly i, I wonder oh man I, I wish i could be a fly on the wall at so many of these conversations but we don't have time for any of this i suppose we should move on yeah this, this should have been a big story i guess uh we, we had a lot more to say about it Hulu has landed a major HBO deal. Huh? Yeah, excited? It's in Japan. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, if, if you are a subscriber to HBO in Japan, uh, instead of HBO Go, you'll get to watch Entourage, Sex and the City, Sopranos on Hulu Japan for a limited time, and the release will be staggered. Um, but hey, at least uh, it's an interesting thing where HBO has said, oh, no, we'll never do that, except in Japan. Except now we will. We'll try it out in Japan. Maybe see how that but goes. But only for if it's only for a limited time, then you really want to be able to DVR it then. Yeah, right. You just It's a toe in the water. I like to see that HBO is trying this. Uh, the French government is considering extending the TV tax to PC screens. I think whenever the government starts to want to tax something, it means it's made it. So the, yeah. Yeah, this is an indication that people are definitely watching TV on their computers. 
So, so here's the yep. weird part is, I mean, you know me, I'm not a fan of taxing anything. Uh, I'm not a fan of the government figuring out some way to, you know, weasel its way into taking more of your money. But uh, to be honest, if there's anything exciting about this to me, it is the fact that TV doesn't mean a cathode ray tube hooked up, taking radio yep. waves, and translating them into a box anymore. TV now means, look. Bro, you may not have this exact device, but you're consuming media through your own way. And I think it's great that that the government is acknowledging that that is an acceptable substitute. And it's what millions of people want to do instead of hooking up to whatever happens to be on the boob tube at any given time. And what's interesting about this is France's, uh, uh, who, who is this, uh, Filippetti. He is the, uh, Aure he's the culture minister, Aurelie, Aurelie Filippetti. Uh, doesn't want to double tax you. If you already pay the TV tax, you're covered. It doesn't matter what screens you have. He wants to tax those who have a computer and no television uh, because they are taking advantage of French video over the Internet. So it's, an, it's at least not trying to extra tax, just trying to tax everybody. Hmm. And that's what and governments Beatmaster do. in the chat room makes a great point. Uh, what about HBO resolution in Japan? 4K maybe? And Japan's even working on 8K, so... Uh, there, therein lies the innovation there. Ah, well, I doubt that the Hulu in Japan is going to be a 4K, but maybe. Maybe? That could, that could happen. Uh, Netflix has added some UK streaming shows to its UK service. Uh, so just days after Love Film touted the, uh, the shows that we were talking about last week, uh, the uh, shows like Modern Family, Lie to Me, Sons of Anarchy, all these shows from Fox, now coming to Netflix in the UK and an exclusive on the new season of the old Fox show Arrested Development set to premiere in 2013. Obviously, coming to Netflix in the US will also come to Netflix UK. Yeah. Yay for UK. Yeah. Let's check the <laughs> tube tops. Google TV got a, an update last week at Google I.O. It wasn't part of the keynotes, uh, but the platform is getting an updated version of the Google Play Store, a new UI that looks a lot like the other devices in the Android system. Uh, it will also receive support for purchasing movies, music, and TV shows from uh, within, as well as subscription billing. Um, there's a bring your app to the big screen presentation that happened last week, uh, trying to add more apps to the Google TV platform, and of course, as we mentioned last week, LG, Sony, and Vizio all coming with new Google TV devices. Scott, what's your, what's your opinion on Google TV? They didn't update it much, but has it changed at all since Google I.O.? Uh, you know, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to look at it. I, I do know that it really stumbled at the beginning, and now it seems to be picking up some steam. I'm glad to see that they're working on new things and introducing new things, and that, as you said, Sony, LG, Vizio are all bringing that out. Uh, the, uh, what was I thinking? Oh, Vizio came out with a new little stream box uh, that will have Google TV on it too. So if you don't have a TV with it, then you'll be able to add it, add it that way. I look forward to checking it out. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to with the Logitech review that I still have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, no, I, I, I must admit I haven't seen much of it yet, but I do intend to look at it more closely now because it does seem to be gaining steam. And Google TV will no longer require hardware manufacturers to provide a physical keyboard in the future. Are we talking voice control coming to a future version of this, you think, Brian? Well, I'll tell you, I, and this is one of the advantages that I think Google TV has over just about any other uh, manufacturer, as far as like home theater box, because it's like, uh, we've talked about this before, the Xbox, the PS3 are, are half a decade out of date now, and they don't look to be being updated in the next two years. Whereas because Google TV is an open standard, because anyone could create any kind of box they want, the more open they are, the more successive uh, reno renovations that you'll see, uh, uh, various iterations as you move forward. And it wouldn't surprise me if somebody took a crazy stab out there and decided to go entirely voice control because when you set up the standard one year, three years later, the entire landscape could be different. And three years ago, nobody thought that voice interface would be an acceptable way to control your media consumption. But now with the advance of Siri and seeing what, what they're doing with Android devices, especially if it's the kind of thing that they could offload all the heavy lifting to the cloud, 
Maybe so, you know, and 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 that's that's what's exciting. That's the reason I'm a PC gamer instead of an Xbox or PS3 gamer is because I love that constant iteration, that ability to jump ahead of the curve and be uh, and and be able to experience things that you can't experience anywhere else. And that's something that Google TV is positioning itself for. Boxing and we on, should. Oh, go ahead, Scott. I was just going to say that uh, Samsung inter- uh, announced at CES this year that it is including um, voice activation in its latest generation of high-end TVs. So we are seeing a move towards that. Well, and keep in mind also, for example, Caffeine Free Dave, I'm in the middle of typing, trying to respond to him in the chat. I should just talk to him. Uh, he says, but I don't want to yell or wave at my gaming box uh, slash TV, Scan School Brian and Ace Detect. The thing is, is you might not have to. What if somebody put out one of these boxes that didn't have a keyboard interface, but instead just said, you can either talk to it or you can use your smartphone or you can use your PC or any number of other ways to to remotely control this device. And that's what's possible when you when you give up some of these, for lack of a better term, regulations that uh, that are associated with a platform. Very quickly, I want to mention Boxy and Comcast have reached an agreement that will allow Boxy users access encrypted basic cable channels. It was revealed in a June 27th filing. Boxy had claimed that the FCC's proposed cable encryption amounted to anti-consumer, uh, but they figure it out. So uh, clear QAM box. IP capable uh, third party devices now can access the encrypted cable channels. So, Boxy on the front lines of that sort of thing. And now, I want to be clear on this, Tom, was this a case where they had to win some kind of legal battle to make it happen? Or no, it doesn't just- sound like it. It sounds like they just uh, worked out an agreement with Comcast uh, to, to figure out how to make the technology work. Also, That's 4K good. TVs coming, but facing an uphill battle in the home. I uh, figured Scott might have an interesting take on this one. Uh, TV makers are uh, in a bit of an impasse on how to get people to upgrade TVs. Ars Technica has <laughs> sort of a feature here. Uh, we mentioned 4K briefly. What's, yeah. what, what's the landscape on this? Well, 4K is coming to, to a TV near you. Uh, we certainly have seen an increase in the number of demos at trade shows. Sony has a 4K projector. It's only 25000 Uh Red Digital Cinema, the company that makes the Red Digital Cinema camera, uh, now has a 4K projector uh, for about ten grand, which is a lot less than the Sony. The big problem, of course, is distribution. How are we... Are the studios, first of all, are the studios going to be willing to let go to distribute 4K content? And B, if they do, how is it going to get into the home? Probably not by streaming, um, possibly by optical disc, but then that brings up the question of is physical media dead? Uh, Red has a solution, interesting solution, which is a uh, a hard disc player, streamer, essentially, and you load 4K content onto it with a uh, an SD card type thing, you know, some memory card, uh, and then it streams 4K to the uh, to their projector certainly, and probably to others as well. Uh, but the big question is: Are studios going to release it, and how is it going to get to people? Uh, and if that if that's if those questions don't get answered as the 4K displays become available, they're going to be all they're going to be good for is upscaling HD, which is to me kind of useless. All right, so uh, Scott, I got I got a challenge for you. I'm going to say something that I'm going to guess you're not going to like, and you probably will disagree with. I'm going to say <laughs> that the surest way for 4K to absolutely fail in the consumer marketplace is to associate it with increased fidelity of the programming that you receive. And the reason is, is this is my favorite thing about this ARS Technica uh, article, is this graph right here that shows uh, basically this is the viewing distance in feet from a screen and this is the size of the screen and this is what it takes to even notice a difference, right? So if a screen is 10 10 feet wide, or I'm sorry, if you're 10 feet away and the screen is 30 inches wide, you will not notice the difference between 480p and uh, and, and 1080p and so on and so on and so on. And we've talked about this before. I, I honestly believe... That if you are, because as you mentioned, we're talking $25,000 for a Sony 4K projector for the home that's still not even available yet. If you're going to- No, it is available. It is available. You can buy it. Okay, perfect. Okay, babe, it's not available to me. How about that? But the, no, well. the, <laughs> the important thing is that if, if you are going to increase the uh, expense for it, you you cannot tout the fidelity of it because uh, especially given that the vast majority of homes at some point, according to this graph, you have to get so far away from the screen 
you're now outside of your living room. People don't have living rooms big enough to get far enough away to notice a difference for it. For it. And, and so well, here, it's, the other, it's the other way around, actually. You have to get you're right, closer, right. I am closer in order to see a difference. Right. Living rooms aren't uh, small enough, Brian. Right. right. That's what, and wait, more. Yeah, but the other, the other point is that, yeah, people can't have a screen big enough at to, you know, in their rooms to see the correct. difference. Correct. That's that's what I should have said. Thank no, no. You, I, for, you know, I actually don't. Yeah, sure. No problem. I actually don't <laughs> disagree with you. Um, you know, with 4K, that's the other issue is will you see a difference? And your eye only has a certain visual resolution, a visual acuity. You can't see things smaller than a certain size at a given distance. Uh, so you're right. You're exactly right. Will 4K so, make, a, make a difference? You can't see the difference on a 50-inch TV at a distance of 10 feet. Here, here is my proposal. Here's what I would like to see. Uh, we saw for a decade a number of cars trying to tout, uh, you know, being 100% electric instead of using any gas whatsoever with varying degrees of success, most of them not very much. Uh, and then along came Tesla that said, we are going to focus for our first vehicle on an extremely high-end hobbyist who has an ex a, a very specific need. We're going to make this thing look totally badass. We're going to make it only a roadster. It'll be completely impractical. And the few people who buy it will absolutely love it for their need. And I am thinking right now about, let me show you, let me show you again, these four screens right here that are running. I do not have enough real estate to manage everything I need to on my computer. A 4K display could replace all four of these stupid monitors and give me <laughs> one giant workspace to work from. And I can envision a world where that is worth $12,000 in order to yep. buy. But it has nothing yep. to do with, with, with content, with, with, with watching Iron Man in a higher resolution. Well, the other, th you're correct. You're correct. Exactly right. And the other thing that 4K is really good for is passive glasses 3D on a flat panel. Because the way it is now, uh, when you watch a Vizio or an LG 3D TV with the passive glasses, each eye is only getting 540 lines of information. So with a 4K display, each eye could get, in fact, 1080. And, and you could see full HD resolution in both eyes. It'll also work on auto stereo, that is glasses-free 3D. Uh, and by the way, Dolby is working on a system uh, uh, of glasses-free 3D that looks far better than any other system of that type I've ever seen. So that, I think, is where 4K is going to make the biggest difference, is the ability to use passive glasses or no glasses and see full HD in each eye uh, without any of the compromises that they currently, that those systems currently have. All right, let's move on to the film film. We're going to move through this stuff pretty quickly because we're uh, running out no, of time. No, 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 no. Show the whole thing. Show the whole thing. Show the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> go watch the Looper uh, trailer. It's full of spoilers, so if you don't want to be spoiled, uh, go watch it, but it's uh, coming out in the U.S. September 28th. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, time-traveling movie about time-traveling assassins. Absolutely worth watching. The first episode of The Silent City, which is a crowdfunded post-apocalyptic web series, has been released. Uh, you can go to The Silent City's website to get it uh, or find it on YouTube, Silent City Episode 1. I watched it. Nice, nice little twist in there. He's looking around for food. Yep. Definitely no, don't, don't, worth don't watching. It, don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. No, no, I, I it says it very... in the title that he's searching, in the description that he's searching for food. I, that's not a spoiler. Okay. I'm not going to make okay. a spoiler. Right. Uh, no, I, I thought it was very charming. I thought it was very well directed. I enjoyed it immensely. And Marvel's The Avengers Blu-ray coming September 25th. Uh, you get uh, two different versions of it. One sells for $50 uh, with a Blu-ray DVD combo and a digital download. Uh, the other sells for $40, which just gives you uh, a, a uh, wait, wait a minute, hold on, I think I got that wrong. 3D is $50 with the digital download, Blu-ray and DVD $40, and then $35 is a four-disc set without the digital download. So just to confuse Ooh, you, yeah. they've got way too many. Uh, but arriving this month will be an app that allows you to play around with the Avengers in advance of getting the Blu-ray, and then it'll work with the Blu-ray as a second screen device once they get released in September. So that's pretty interesting. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and finally, something I think we'll start checking in on. Deadline has been doing this for a while now. YouTube channel rank every week. They come out on Monday with the ranking of the YouTube channels, how many weekly views, 
uh, what the prior week's rank was, a little kind of digest. Uh, for instance, uh, this week, uh, a show called IMO and a series called Mindless Takeover launched on the teen channel Awesomeness TV. And because it's a new channel, uh, it, was a, it was a big debut, uh, rocketing 69 places to number eight with 1.5 million views. Uh, the Warner Sound on top this week, followed by SourceFed, Shut Up Cartoons, Wigs, and ENTV. So good place to find different channels on YouTube that you might want to watch uh, if you're looking for different kinds yeah. of programming. Help me out here, Tom, because I'm looking at this list. I'm, I apologize. I'm going to flip my screen over to it. But it's like if you look at the weekly views here, you've got if you go all the way down, you got some that are like uh, 49 views or 255. How which which number should I be looking at for which one of these is is the real number that justifies it in the top 100? The weekly views are the number that justifies it in the top 100. And so channels with a, with no new content sometimes will uh, have not many views, but the total views are over there on the right. So these are partner huh. channels. So it's not every channel that exists on YouTube. That's the other thing. Oh, partner channels only. Okay, no, no, no. Yeah, that clarifies yeah. it. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the movie draft. Ted was last week's movie. It was Justin Roberts Young's movie in our movie draft. Made $54 million. Not bad. Not bad yeah, at all. No. In fact, in fact, that was a big surprise. I remember uh, Justin was griping pretty heavily about the fact that he got screwed out of G.I. Joe. But I'll tell you, uh, Ted has overperformed expectations, especially for just being a, a raunchy comedy. Um, but I think you're burying the lead there, Mr. Tom Merritt. No, we always start. We always, I'm not burying anything. We always start with the movie that just came out. And then we go to the rankings where Scott Johnson has nudged back into first place. Because all I have is one movie, unless you count The Raven as a movie. In which case, I have two <laughs> movies. Uh, and so he's got all of his movies have been out now. He's got $627 million. I've got $622 million. And then Tom. Justin Robert Young is, is on a roll because The Amazing Spider-Man comes out this week. Are you worried that Total Recall and Paranorman combined will make less than the $5 million it'll take for you to take back number one? No, no not at all. I'm still worried about Sarah Lane, who is in last place right now only because none of her movies have come out. Hey, let me point one other little tidbit out, too. Take a look. What is the number one best pick dollar for dollar in the entire draft right now? Madagascar 3. Always go with the kids' movies. That was a smart buy, Brian Brushwood. $18 I bought it, and it's already made 180 It's made over $10 million for every Brian Buck spent. I'm At least I've got some kind of Pyrrhic victory to my horrible performance this year. I don't know how I didn't buy Madagascar 3, because uh, I definitely wanted it. Uh, it, was, it was definitely a good call. Uh, so, yes, yeah, Spider-Man uh, premieres in the middle of the week, so midnight tomorrow... I think, or actually midnight tonight, because it comes out tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, no, that makes sense. We're seeing a lot of Wednesday. Oh, wait, today's only Monday. Wow, a Tuesday premiere? That's crazy, Tom. Yeah, it's because it's of the July 4th being in the middle of the week, uh, Independence uh, Day yeah. holiday here in the U.S. So I, I, are any of these movies uh, interesting to you, Scott? Oh, I think Spider-Man's going to be great. I'm looking forward to that. Um, <clears throat> I was not at all interested in Ted until I heard a review on NPR, I think, and uh, the reviewer was uh, more impressed than he thought he would be. <laughs> and and so, good. you know, I mean, I'm just, I'm not at all into uh, raunchy comedies or um, who's the guy who plays the voice of Ted? Uh, yeah, uh, Seth MacFarlane. Seth MacFarlane, right. I, I'm not really into Family Guy, um, but, uh, you know, the it, it, the premise sounded a little interesting. And once I, you get past all the gross jokes. It, uh, it's essentially I, I it's essentially the Muppets, but without any of that Muppet happiness. <laughs> Just nothing. <laughs> it's somewhere between the Muppets and Avenue Q. It's like, you, you know. Go. Right, right. But I yeah. mean, a teddy bear feebles. going out and looking for a job and, and you know, getting drunk. I mean, that, that could be good. Yeah. Let's move on to what Spider-Man for sure. Yeah. Madagascar 3, can't wait. What we're watching. I just want to start what we're watching because uh, while I did watch True Blood and Newsroom this week and, and they were great episodes, I actually got sucked into the Wigs channel watching a show called Jan. Uh, we mentioned that in the, in the deadline rankings as one of the top channels on YouTube because we set up the Google Nexus queue 
to try yeah, it out. So tell me about this thing. You found this gizmo, like it descended, like what? Did a comet collide with the Earth and you had this orb that you picked up? and you <laughs> That's pretty your- much it. It was wrapped in a towel and I brought the smoking remains inside the house. Uh, super, super easy to set up. You plug in the HDMI cable, you plug in the power. Done. Then you go to your Android device. Now, here's the thing. We have a Nexus 7 in the house right now. Uh, if Otherwise, we had probably would have had to use the Samsung Galaxy S or something like that. Um, Ugh, but the trials could, and tribulations of you, watching stuff on. If you have an Android device, <laughs> it's actually pretty brilliant to set up because Bluetooth connects to the queue and it says, uh, what Wi-Fi do you want to put on the queue? You put in your Wi-Fi password on the phone. So much easier than doing some kind of on-screen setup. And then... It's very easy to stream music and videos to it. You can continue to use your phone or your tablet to do other things while it's streaming because you're just sending a command to it. It's not actually streaming it from the device. That's the brilliance of it. It's getting it from the cloud. It's, I don't know if it's worth $299 for what it does, but what it does, it does really well. And we ended up watching like 12 episodes of, of this short series. They're, they're around eight minutes an episode with Stephen Moyer from True Blood starring in it uh, on, on the Wigs channel. And it was just, it was easy because we were just doing other things and we got them playing and it's like, oh, let's play the next one. Go to the app, now, press you, play. It, don't you have way. to plug, a, but, plug speakers into it as well? Well, no, because it's HDMI. Uh, so <coughs> oh, oh, so oh. I just plugged it into my system and the speakers that are in my system played the audio. Okay, okay. Now, now at $299, uh, that seems like uh, it's important to distinguish whether this was a test unit that you got or whether you... Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. This is, this is a unit that Eileen, my wife, got on behalf of CNET when she was at Google I.O. last week. So it was, it was yeah, one you, of the I'll giveaways. You, like, it's, it's one of those things where it's like I, I'm always – uh, and, and we're in this position as journalists or media figures. People give us stuff to, to play with or whatever. And like as much as I love the, the, the Sonos that I got, I have no earthly idea on how I would feel about it if, if Sonos didn't just give it to me. But because they did, I, I mean I know I like it and I, I – and I know that if you took it away, I would pay you however much it is. I know they're stupid expensive. Uh, if I took away your queue, would you pay $300 to get it back? No, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. I, I would not. And, and, and that's not even, you know, I kind of like it, but I kind of like it. It's not something where I'm like, oh, I need to pay $300. I got other things. To, you know, I'm gonna, I'll waste money on the Nexus 7, no doubt. Uh, yeah. But, but this, this, it's just so weird to me because they did a really good job. It's a really good piece of hardware. It's very usable. I don't think anybody's going to buy it. Ugh, what a tragedy. Is yeah. it only content from, from Google Play? Is that correct? Google Play, YouTube, and, uh, and the music from Google Music. Oh. Because, and, and this I'm, is the key to making it work really easily, is it actually just pulls things from your Google account. So it has to be stuff that's in your Google account. You can't send Netflix there because it can't access Netflix. It doesn't have the right to access Netflix directly on your behalf. That would be a nifty trick if they can get the licensing agreements worked out where all it says is, author, oh, do you, have you gotten, downloaded the Netflix app to your Android device? Great. We'll, uh, we'll use that to play on the Google Nexus, but it doesn't work that way. Too bad. Yeah. Because that might start to make it worth it. I still think it's kind of expensive. And it does have, by the way, optical out and all of that if you want to hook it up to, to better speakers than just your HDMI cable. But Wow, look at, that, well, look at that tagline there. The world's first social streaming media player. I don't know that that could be a worse tagline to make me want to buy <laughs> this streaming device. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, real quickly, uh, Scott, what, anything you've been watching that you want to make special note of? Uh, I've been watching... Um, uh, the newsroom, great show. Uh, you know, it, typical Aaron Sorkin. It, it it does for news what Aaron did for politics in the West Wing. I agree. I'm uh, watching it too. Yeah, but it but it's really great. Very fast paced. Um, excellent points being made. Uh, I'm I'm loving it. Brian, what about you? You finally yeah, finished actually- Legend of Korra. I'm I, I'm actually about to start watching the newsroom because I finally set up the HBO Go app, which I I don't know if it's because I knew I had a deadline coming up because now that Game of Thrones is over, I really have no way to justify my HBO subscription. So I'm just gonna watch that <laughs> on HBO Go real quick and then and then cancel everything. And I think when I say cancel everything, I think I'm gonna cancel everything. I think I'm gonna cancel my phone. I think I'm gonna cancel cable altogether and begin. The, the great cord cutting experiment. Uh, but uh, uh, on HBO Go, we're watching the backlog of, of Veep and we're going to watch the newsroom. Um, it's cute. 
I guess, uh, Vipas. Uh, finished The Legend of Korra, which was amazing. If you're watching it, then you know why it's amazing. If you're not, then you're a terrible person. Uh, Tron Uprising, I'm continuing to watch, which I'm a grown man watching cartoons. It continues to be absolutely gorgeous. I'm at this point now, four or five episodes in, where I would really, really like to see more depth instead of a adventure of the week. I'd like to see more depth of characters. And, uh, and finally, just because I didn't know, I, I guess... There are ads all over the place from uh, from whatever foundations paying for the movie. But uh, uh, I finally watched part one of Atlas Shrugged on Netflix. And it's like, it was really, they made some bold decisions. It was like, they clearly made that movie only for people who already loved Atlas Shrugged. They didn't even attempt to make anything make sense to anyone who uh, who is not already a fan of the book. Do you find out who John Galt is finally? No, not in the first one. No. That's the all second right. one. Let's uh, finish up with some feedback then. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Radio, yeah. First email says, who's John Galt? I don't know. Second email <laughs> says, hi, Frame Raiders. Uh, it's from Anders. In episode 82, a viewer wrote in and asked for a discussion about what a world without DRM would look like. One facet that I think was overlooked was cable, satellite, terrestrial TV boxes. In the conventional subscription TV business, the DRM not only prevents the content from being pirated, it also binds the customer to using one of the very few boxes that support the same DRM scheme as the provider uses. This prevents third-party box manufacturers from competing with features like better user interfaces. Speaking as a box developer, I can also say that integrating, testing, and certifying the DRM firmware component is a significant part of the development time for a cable box. In a world without DRM, that time could go into a better user experience or cheaper hardware. Anders, I like this email. Thank you for writing in. If you want to complain about the interface on your cable box or your satellite box, DRM is one of the things you should point to when you're complaining. Absolutely. From Simon, he says uh, to Frame Ray, Hi guys, I live in the UK and have recently started using Love Film Streaming. At the end of watching North by Northwest, I instinctively thought about seeing if there were any behind the scenes documentaries on the disc, then remembered I was streaming. If we eventually go to physical media lists in the future, could we see the end of special features? I hope not. Love the show. All the best. And I'm going to say, first of all, um, the whole reason we had special features to begin with is because we had a platform of physical media that allowed for extra horse crap. And they decided to fill it with special features, whether it was behind the scenes stuff, uh, commentary tracks, alternate stuff or whatever. Uh, there's no reason that special features couldn't continue to exist because the, the thing is, and, and especially maybe as an advertisement, think about all the leaked special features in the lost DVD. And think about how many DVDs that sold to see just, just a few more seconds of that lost universe uh, I got to imagine that that special features are, are not going anywhere. They may change uh, how many they have and what form they take, but uh, but I can't imagine them going away. Tom? iTunes actually has special features in a lot of their videos, so no, it's not going anywhere. Really? Yep. In fact, when we watched Thor, uh, we were able to to access some special features. So it's not quite as tricked out yet as as DVDs, but yeah. There's like Brian. I totally agree with Brian. No reason that that can't happen and probably will happen eventually. Finally, I totally uh, agree. Brian writes in and says, hey, guys, I can't get enough of your show. I'm about five minutes from setting up a collection to buy Brian Brush with his own mobile T1. Uh, anyway, I'm a Doctor Who fan, but I'm a little weirded out by the Dolby Atmos system. My wife is a trademark paralegal, and I realize that there won't be confusion in the marketplace with the name, but I won't go to a movie theater with the Atmos system. I don't want the possibility of inhaling poisonous gas. He's referring to the <laughs> Centauran stratagem episode of Doctor Who. Oh, uh, seriously, man. though, if you were charged with naming this new sound system and you came up with the Doctor Who reference, would you really chance the possibility that people would have negative thoughts about your new system and choose to name your system Atmos anyway? Scott, did you know this was a Doctor Who reference? I did not. I did not. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, I thought either. it was a great name myself. I, you know, it, atmospheric. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought it was a very good name. But if it has this connotation, it's sort of like you know Chevy Nova, selling in selling in Mexico. Nova, Nova yeah, the no go, no yeah. go, doesn't go. Uh, but I, I didn't know that about doc, the Doctor Who reference. Uh, I certainly like the Atmos system. What I've experienced of it, absolutely. 
Brian doesn't yeah. bother you either, does it? Because you haven't uh, got no, that not, far. No, I, I hadn't seen that episode, but I do think it's interesting. It's, it's, I think it's the kind of thing that when you are part of that 3% of the populace that, that has a built-in association, it's highly, highly negative for you. But for the other 97% of people, that word is a blank slate that'll mean whatever you put it in. And I used to go nuts over this stuff uh, when, when I was in my early 20s. Because until I realized, like, oh, not everyone has had the same experiences that I have. So I'm not, I'm not the least bit bothered by this. I just think about the victory at the Battle of Canary Wharf, and I'm fine. doesn't bother me. <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> that is it for this episode of Frame Rate. Uh, thank you so much, Scott Wilkinson, for uh, helping us inaugurate our new recording time with your new studio. Let folks know uh, where they can find not only Home Theater Geeks, but all the work you do online. Sure. Uh, home Theater Geeks is uh, Mondays at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, two hours before your fine show. And uh, you can find me online at hometheater.com. That's it for this episode of Frame Rate, folks. You can find us live on Mondays now, 3 p.m. Pacific time, 6 p.m. Eastern time. And you can always find us on demand at twit.tv slash fr. Email us framerate at twit.tv. We'll see you next time. <laughs>